Welcome to this opening seminar for our new Center of Sustainable Healthcare Education. I've looked forward to this day for some time and believe it will be a very good starting point for the Center. My name is Nina Wellesta and I will chair this seminar. Due to the current restrictions in social gathering, the event is completely digital and the presenters are located at different places. This will hopefully work well. The format has led us not to open for questions or comments from the audience. We are sorry about that, but the seminar is recorded, so it will be made available afterwards. And with these introductory words, it is an honor to introduce Rector of the University of Oslo, Svein Stirling, to give a short welcome and opening for the seminar. Please, Svein. The word Thank, you so much. Much. Thank you so much. And uh, it is indeed a great honor to be allowed to give a short introduction and welcome you all to the opening of your, our brand new Center for Excellence in Education, Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education. It's about providing students with competence and skills, tools that, uh, how to say, includes sustainability in their professional choices and in their skills. And that's important, I think. This enables them to become major change agents within health service on individual, societal, global level. And this is completely in line with the university strategy for the next 10 years, the strategy 2030, where contributions to the UN sustainable development agenda is like a red thread, or I like to call it a green thread to our whole strategy, and that's important. Good health and well-being is one of the 17 goals of the Sustainable Development Agenda, but they're connected to others as well, of course, fighting poverty, uh, clean water and, and sanitation, you have the one on reducing inequality, you have zero hunger. And these challenges are all interlinked, and I think that's one of the major challenges of science and education in the times to come. Finding solutions requires this interdisciplinarity and it also requires partnerships, cooperation across disciplines and across different sectors. And that's important when we evolve our study programs. So it's my hope that she will become a catalyst for this. Knowledge of tying together research, education, innovation and dissemination. And I'm sure that the center will be a good example on how we can do that at the university uh, to contribute to the development agenda. Um, the establishment by itself shows how you as scientists are affected by the UN sustainable development agenda and use this when you develop new type of programs. So we have two distinguished keynote speakers here today, Vice Chancellor at Karolinska Institute, Ole Ottersen, and Trisha Green Halch, Professor of Primary Healthcare Sciences at the University of Oxford. And that's a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, seminar. My predecessor as a rector at the University of Oslo, Ole Peter, has long been engaged internationally with the issue of inequalities in access to healthcare, uh, amongst others as a chair of the Lancet University of Oslo Commission on Global Governance for Health. And uh, it's a happy to see you, Ole Peter, and I can assure you that initiative you have taken at the University of Oslo on interdisciplinarity, on life science and on global healthcare is live and kicking here at the University of Oslo still, and that's important. With uh, regards to our other keynote sp uh, speaker, Professor Trisha Greenhalgh, uh, she is an internationally recognized academic in primary healthcare, combining social sciences and medicine and also focusing on technology. Again, showing what we really need to do more of in the future, this combination of different fields and different parts of the whole uh, palette of different uh, subjects uh, of science. She's going to talk to us about the initiative in light of the pandemic, the, the, the SHE initiative, and that's very important and, and interesting, of course. I would also stress that these are only part part of an interesting, highly interesting program that also involves students. And I think that's really beautiful. And I really look forward to today's seminar. I'm going to, I'm able to, to stay for one hour on, but I'm really looking forward to that. And with this, I, I really welcome you and I wish you best of luck with this important seminar. And this is only the start, of course, 
of a very important center for University of Oslo, for the faculty, and I think for Norway, really. So good luck with the seminar, and thank you so much for your efforts. Thank you so much for this. Uh, and we will now move over to a brief presentation for the center, of the ideas for the center. The two presenters are two of my colleagues that I've had the privilege to collaborate with for many years. Both Christian Hagen and Ivan Engenbrechtsen are professors at the Department of Interdisciplinary Health Sciences. Ivan is currently Vice Dean at the Faculty of Medicine, a position Christian had the preceding eight years. Please, Ivan and Christian, we are looking forward to your presentation of the center IDs. Thank you, Nina. The focus of our center is and the implementation of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in medicine and health education. We will qualify future health professionals to make wise, evidence-based, sustainable decisions. And in addition to being evidence-based, such decisions must be based on key principles and values that underpin the SDGs such as applying long-term perspectives and also broad and multi-sectorial approaches to health, ensuring that no one is left behind. And the COVID-19 pandemic has made it impossible for us to ignore the SDGs. And as Ole Petter Ottersen and I argue in this recent comment, uh, the pandemic brings to the fore the consequences of, of not having health insurance or access to health care, not having water or food supply during lockdowns, or not having civil rights. And therefore, with health as a lens, uh, it is apparent how the myriad targets incorporated into the SDGs are interlinked and interdependent. Since the 90s, lots of resources have been invested in research and development in order to facilitate uh, sustainable uh, education. But little or none of this has been related to our professions. So drawing on the framework of competences for sustainable development, which is previously outlined by UNESCO, the aim of our center is to translate and adapt this framework for the use in health professional education. The competences are system thinking competence, anticipatory, normative, strategic and collaborative competence. And our basic assumption is that we, by fostering these key competences, can prepare future health professionals for making sustainable evidence-based decisions on different levels of healthcare. And to give one example, uh, what we mean by system thinking competency is to cultivate the students' abilities to analyze complex systems. And in the field of healthcare, this general competency can be translate, translated into a concern with social determinants of health uh, and the importance of, of housing conditions during the pandemic is only one example of this. And in she, we will try to translate this into pedagogical approaches, such as analysis of complex cases. Anticipatory competence is the ability to craft rich pictures for, of the future related to sustainability issues and sustainability problem solving. In healthcare, this means to identify potential conflict between available treatment patient lifestyle or risk of overtreatment. Teaching student risk assessment can be one possible pedagogical approach. So she will basically develop and test educational modules and pedagogical methods, and also pilot new models for evidence-based decision-making inspired by the SDGs, both nationally and internationally. Faced with the immense challenges embodied by the SDGs and highlighted by COVID-19, we strongly argue that the biggest threat to the implementation of the SDGs is resignation and indifference. Thanks to DICU and the 12 international experts, 
for supporting the faculties as a view application. And thanks to all the supportive colleagues across the Faculty of Medicine, and we are privileged indeed to have a large and very enthusiastic and engaged group of students. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for these introductory words. I'm making it very clear in a very short time some of the ideas that you have behind this center. Our next speaker is the chair of advisory board for the center. He's currently president of the Karolinska Institute, and before that, he was rector at the University of Oslo. He has been a leading voice in pointing out the need to configure, reconfigure the healthcare education with many articles and comments written on the need to implement the sustainable development goals in education. Please, Ole Petter, I leave the word to you. Thank you, it's, uh, it's really great. Uh, to be online, even though it uh, would have been even better to be here in person. Congratulations to all of you for this, uh, I would call it a major achievement, to have the first center of excellence in Norway in the realm of health. And uh, I think it's uh, really appropriate that the first center is directed, focused on exactly what you're discussing now, the sustainable development goals. It's time to increase our efforts to uh, reach the ambitions embedded in these goals. I have a presentation here and uh, I hope it works. Uh, let's see. And uh, please give me a signal if it uh, is working. Uh, Nina, is it working? Is it working? That's, that's fine. Yeah. It's working great. So um, let's see if everything is in place, you know, yeah. So um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, exactly what you mentioned in your introduction, how the SDGs of the Sustainable Development Goals can serve as an inspiration and uh, as uh, guidelines for how we develop the education in the time to come. I must say at the very beginning that uh, it's, uh, it calls for humility to see how the current crisis, COVID-19, has um, revealed significant voids in our knowledge as to how to uh, care for people in a crisis and not least those that are particularly vulnerable. And uh, I think that uh, it must be a major effort of any university to see how we can fill these voids in our knowledge and ensure that we are better prepared next time around when a crisis hits. Um, I even re uh, referred to a commentary that we had in uh, Nature Medicine just a few days ago, uh, a, a commentary that could serve as a prelude to the discussion that we're going to have today. And, uh, what uh, I think we all agree on is that uh, COVID-19, with all the it involves, it also has a silver lining because COVID-19 tells us in no uncertain terms that we have to look much more explicitly on the sustainable development goals and how we can possibly reach them within the time frame of 2030. In fact, uh, I think that uh, COVID-19 serves as a reminder as to how important the SDGs are. And also, in fact, uh, COVID-19 makes the um, Sustainable Development Goals even more comprehensible for the society at large, because COVID-19 serves as what we could call the great unveiler. It unveils all the inequities in society today that translates, in fact, into stark and uh, very challenging inequalities in health during this uh, pandemic. This is uh, from a paper that we just submitted to the British Medical Journal. And uh, we say exactly what also Avin uh, said, that COVID-19 serves as a lens that uh, unveils and magnify the inequities that we have in our society today, and that now translate or metamorphose into stark inequalities in health. And uh, I'm 
when I prepared this lecture, I was reminded of my first experience as a very small and young boy when Martin Luther King got his Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. And uh, he had a quote that has been with me over the last 10 years or so. And I think uh, this quote reminds us even today of uh, what we are up to when it comes to injustice in health. Of all the forms of inequality, he said in a speech, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhuman. And uh, this is a quote, I think, that should guide us in the years to come. Uh, in fact, what we are doing now, next week, is to have a conference at uh, Karolinska Institute on exactly this, injustice, inequalities in health, revealed by COVID-19. And as you can see from the picture, Anders Tegnell, uh, I guess is known even in Norway, will uh, take part in, in this uh, discussion next week. I'm really looking forward to this. And we also have an author in the panel and an ethicist. So uh, as was pointed out in, in, in the introduction, when we really go for the ambitions that are embedded in SDGs, we have to work across discipline, not only across medical disciplines. We also have to engage all other parts of society to really achieve something significant in the perspective of the SDGs. As um, Sven Sterling, rector, uh, pointed out, in fact, my own engagement and KI's engagement, I would say, started with the uh, Lancet University of Oslo Commission that I was uh, chairing uh, a few years back in time. And I hope that many of my colleagues in this commission are following this uh, particular conference. I have so fond memories after having collaborated with my distinguished colleagues on this commission for so many years. And what we say in this commission is relevant, even more relevant today than it was uh, a few years ago, we must reach beyond the health sector to find effective solutions. We must work cross-sectorally and we must be humble. It's not just about medicine and, and healthcare. It's about the society at large. We have to include and engage all sectors in society to find effective solutions. For example, when it comes to filling the voids in of knowledge that have been unveiled during this particular crisis. So the Lancet Commission, um, that looked at the political and commercial determinants of health and the political origins of health inequities is very much uh, in evidence, in fact, in the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which also, as uh, Sven Stern pointed out, sees health not only as something that is constrained to goal three, but as something that pervades most of the 17 goals, at least 14 of the 17 uh, goals have health very much in evidence when it comes to the ambitions that have to be reached for 2030. In the Lancet University of Oslo Commission, we came out with uh, what we call dysfunctions in uh, the global governance system and in the governance system at large. And now we see that these dysfunctions, they play out before our eyes. For instance, that health, unfortunately, very often is subordinated to economic goals. See what happens in some societies today one would like to open up society prematurely because of the economic outfall, the economic fallout of the uh, lockdowns and other health measures. Let's look at the policy, policy space for health. Look at how, in fact, the institutions that are set to uh, achieve and to um, ensure that uh, uh, health measures are being taken seriously, that they are sidelined by politics in this particular crisis. Uh, this is something that really is uh, uh, a very, very serious symptom of the current crisis. Look at the institutions that uh, often do not change when they need to change because of the knowledge that we gain during this particular crisis. Sticky institutions, that's also a challenge for the future. And it's the students that we have today that have to make the changes necessary to ensure that we have a governance system that is, that is up to the challenges that we face, not only in a crisis, but also between crises. The Institute uh, came up with a new strategy last year, and uh, it's called uh, Strategy 2030. Exactly, I understand that the uh, University of Oslo will have exact the same time horizon for its uh, strategy. 
And of course, we chose 2030 as a time horizon exactly because we wanted to have a strategy that's, that is aligned with UN Agenda 2030 and a strategy that can be inspired by UN strategy, UN Agenda 2030. And our mission says that we are advancing knowledge about life, that's basic science, but we have in our mission also a sentence saying that we should strive towards better health for all. And all is this magic word that we have to convey to all our students that as a university, it's even in our name, we must work across borders, that means globally, across social divides, we have to look for equitable health. And across generations, we have to look for sustainable health. And if there's something that is, I guess, something that we have to regret as universities, is that we haven't really taken the time dimension seriously. We have been looking at the global aspects of, of health, certainly, we have gone back in history to understand how health has developed, but we haven't really been looking sufficiently into the future of health will de develop given the challenges that we face today. So last year, we uh, had a major conference at the KI with more than 500 students from all over Sweden. And the title of this conference was exactly uh, what uh, was alluded to previously, rethinking higher education inspired by the sustainable development goals. And um, we had several very distinguished speakers there, including uh, Helen Clark, previous prime minister of uh, New Zealand and head of uh, UNDP. And uh, what we was, were focusing on in this particular seminar was how to integrate SDGs into the curriculum. And this is a major challenge. We again have to be humble because this has to compete with all other very, very important goals for a curriculum. So uh, it's really, I must say, an effort that we should not underestimate to get SDGs appropriately into the curriculum. Uh, there are three levels of education, of course. Uh, Frank's commission from 2010, uh, describes this uh, in a very elo uh, eloquent fashion. We have the informative aspect of education, that's easy, and much of it can be gained through the internet nowadays. We have the formative level of education where values are taken into account. We know that uh, information has, has no relevance unless the information is based on uh, core values that we all adhere to. And then we have the important level that the SDGs address and that this new center addresses, and that is the transformative element, where we have to educate students that uh, will be the leaders of tomorrow that can serve as change agents, which are very much needed in order to meet ambitions in the SDGs. Again, I would say that university have, uh, universities have learned to transcend geographical boundaries. We are very good at that but we are not as good when it comes to taking into account the responsibility that we have for future generations. In fact, I must say that uh, I'm not that proud when I look back at the history of universities over the last century. We have to change this. In uh, a chapter that uh, Avin and uh, Anna Wahlberg and I <clears throat> submitted uh, just a while ago, and it's in print now, we look exactly at this. How does history tell, tell us about the responsibility that we have to take on today when it comes to the SDGs and the agenda of 2030? If we compress time as we have to do as universities, to see how history translates into the future, we have to take responsibility for what we call counter innovations. It's a new term that we devised for this particular uh, chapter. For instance, from academia came penicillin, came uh, the green revolution. What we see now is that these innovations, fantastic innovations, they also give us challenges in the time to come. And then as I see it, it is over responsibility to come up with what we call counter innovations. For, for example, for example, to look at uh, antibiotic resistance, which was predicted by Sir Alexander Fleming already in 1945. What uh, are we up to at this moment? 
at KI. And uh, I have just two more slides now. The first thing is to see how we can translate what we're talking about now in more abstract terms into a concrete project. So we are developing a center of excellence for sustainable health with Makarere University in Uganda and other Sub-Saharan universities to see if you could come up with new modes of international co cooperation, again, inspired by the SDGs, with reverse innovation, with attention to socioeconomic, commercial, and political determinants of health, and also with a focus on how to go from science to policy. That is very much needed. And we have an MOU now with WHO that uh, is focusing on exactly this, how to move from science to policy. We need comprehensive and sustainable healthcare services. And um, we also have now established an interdisciplinary resource group that couples together all the disciplines that we have at KI to see how we can think and act horizontally across sectors, across disciplines, across all the different uh, areas of research that are required to help us meet the ambitions in the SDGs. And also, of course, there is no way that we can succeed with horizontal thinking in academia unless we also encourage horizontal thinking and cross-sectoral agency at the national level. And I'm so happy that in Sweden now we managed to get together five very important committees in Riksdagen, in the Swedish parliament, to discuss mental health, the future challenges relating to mental health. This is cross-sectoral governance for health being played out in the Swedish parliament. And I'm, I'm here now giving in the Swedish parliament on this picture, the introduction to this uh, very, very important and rare meeting, I would say, because it's very rare that all these committees meet. Uh, we have much to build on at KI. Uh, we have uh, the highest share of sustainable development goal related publications, according to Stint, 73% of all the papers are related to, to SDG, SDG3. And the, yesterday I got uh, a mail from the CEO of Elsevier saying that according to their statistics, we contribute significantly to SDG3, good health and well-being. Uh, only UCL, they say, is uh, in front of us in Europe when it comes to this particular goal. So. The last slide, summary. What are we doing now at KI and what should we do, I think, more uh, generally in the academic world? We should couple local, local sustainability efforts to the global one to have a mutual inspiration between the two. We are now establishing a professorship in global uh, transformation for health. And we are ad advocating for what we call universal preparedness for health across all different boundaries, including generational boundaries. And for this, we need education for sustainable health. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for these inspiring and interesting thoughts and plans that you have. We'll now move on to our true international speaker. Trisha Greenow is professor at, Uni at Oxford University. She has a long and impressive interdisciplinary research activity, which she uses also in public discussions about the role of university in the society. This last year, she has also been active in using her knowledge in discussions on management of the COVID-19 pandemic. Trisha, the word is yours. Thank you, Nina. Um, well, I've been asked to speak about sustainable health education and the COVID-19 19 pandemic but before i do that can i congratulate you all on setting up this wonderful new center which i'm absolutely delighted to be uh having a part in as i understand it uh, your vision for sustainable health education is that your students will develop a global vision they will develop systems thinking a commitment to social justice critical engagement with the evidence base, not just being evidence-based, but questioning what we mean by that evidence base, and an interdisciplinary, interprofessional and collaborative approach to learning. Now, uh, since I was asked to talk about the pandemic, I thought I'd distinguish between two kinds of science, easy science and uh, what I've called difficult <laughs> science. So, 
An example of easy science, dexamethasone for severely ill patients with COVID-19. In this example, randomized controlled trials were relatively easy to do. They quickly produced definitive evidence, which was distributed around the world and literally changed practice overnight. Difficult science, masks and face coverings for preventing the spread of COVID-19. And here's a picture of President Trump refusing to take the mask that he's been offered. Um, there were no randomized controlled trials, at least not on COVID-19, and, and arguably such trials were impossible because, of course, the mask is mainly for source control. Uh, but we'll all agree that masking quickly became a political issue and scientists took sides or they were depicted as taking sides. Now, a standard definition of evidence-based medicine well, my definition is nice clean experiments on well-defined population samples. And the dexamethasone example uh, is a good example of that. Uh, you've probably seen this hierarchy of evidence with the randomized controlled trials, the systematic reviews at the top, and then down through the rainbow, these other kinds of evidence which are defined in this hierarchy as less good, less worthy. Uh, now that's fine. In relation to dexamethasone, I, I'm absolutely in support of this hierarchy, but it doesn't work so well when you apply it to masks. This is a screenshot from the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine at the University of Oxford. So the same university as me, but this is a different uh, research center. And it's run by Carl Hennigan uh, and his colleague Tom Jefferson worked with him to do some systematic reviews of randomized trials in relation to masks. And you can see the conclusion they came to. Evidence from 14 trials on the use of masks versus no masks was disappointing, they say. It showed no effect uh, in either healthcare workers or community settings. Now, what they did here to produce their review was they took the top of the triangle, they took the randomized controlled trials and all other study designs, they uh, metaphorically, they threw them in the trash can. Uh, and I just want to uh, question this. But first of all, I want to uh, remind you of this wonderful paper written by Ivan and his colleagues, uh, Tony and, and John, they're probably listening actually, I hope they are. Um, I love this paper because what they're doing is questioning the knowledge translation metaphor. And they argue that translation from one language to another is never done by what I'm calling a bilingual parrot. Uh, it's never direct. Rather, that translation involves judgments, compromises, and attention to different audiences and contexts. Similarly, they argue in this paper, the translation of research evidence is not a simple act of summarizing and handing over facts. Rather, it involves judgments, and as we've heard before, uh, value-driven choices. Uh, and I think I wanna just unpack what we mean by some of those values. What did Hennigan and Jefferson throw into the trash can? What kinds of evidence did they uh, ignore because it was too far down the hierarchy of evidence? Many kinds of evidence. For example, these sneeze videos, pictures of people sneezing with the droplets lit up. This didn't look very scientific to them, even though it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And these stories of people going to choir practice and then many, many members of the choir uh, developing COVID-19, some of whom died. Again, this, this wasn't a scientific experiment, so they just said we don't need to take any notice of it. And perhaps most interesting of all for the purposes of today, uh, they ignored the stories of other countries. This is uh, a, a graph from a, a paper by Christian Loeffler and his colleagues up the vertical axis is mortality, this is deaths, and along the horizontal axis time from the first case of COVID-19 in a country. And you can see that countries that introduced masking uh, by 15 or by 30 days had almost no deaths, whereas those who didn't had very, very high death rates. And we can argue about why that might be. But the interesting thing that I, I wanted to point out is this idea that 
this was interpreted as a cultural thing for the Asians. Oh, those Asians, they wear masks. It's what they do, like they eat strange food, uh, this kind of thing. It was never seriously uh, taken on board or uh, explained within that center for evidence-based medicine. Now, back in March, some colleagues and I wrote this paper in the British Medical Journal, arguing for what we call the precautionary principle. We don't have 100% proof yet, but the evidence is pointing in the direction that masks could save many thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of lives. So let's err on the side of caution. Let's wear them because we don't think they can do much harm. Uh, so uh, this probably changed practice in the UK. It took a few weeks, uh, but it wasn't very popular uh, amongst people who were opposed to masks. So this is a message which was posted in the chat column when I gave a Zoom lecture on masks from the University of Oxford a few weeks ago. And the person who posted this was uh, signing in with a white male name. We don't know whether it was a false name, but it sounds like this person identified as a white male. And I also have received many, many personal threats and websites. You can, you can search my name if you want and find the websites that have been set up to attack me and discredit me as a scientist. Uh, and there's a lot of scientists working around COVID-19 who are getting this kind of treatment. Martin McKee and his colleagues uh, published this paper, are populist leaders creating the conditions for the spread of COVID-19? And in this, they used political science theories and methods to present the case that the libertarian right in general are anti-masks, anti-lockdown, pro-segmentation, the idea that the old and vulnerable should stay at home uh, in order that other people should be able to enjoy their freedom. And of course, the uh, question of herd immunity, let the disease sweep over the country. Yes, some people will die, uh, but, but, but you know, they're, they're expendable. There is also a, a paper, which I think, I think your students should read, actually. It's a beautiful paper by Jason Harsin called Toxic White Masculinity, Post-Truth Politics and the COVID-19 Infodemic. Uh, and what he argues is that the proponents of these views tend to be, although they are not always, white and male, aggressively confident and hierarchical and dismissive of female traits such as emotionality that includes caring about these deaths um, and power sharing and admission of uncertainty and I was really interested when Kristen uh, and Ole I think talked about the main barrier to the SDGs might be indifference that caring about uh, social justice is seen as uh, some kind of weak thing. Well, let's go to the Great Barrington Declaration. These are three professors, one from Oxford, one from Harvard, one from Stanford, bringing the weight of their ancient institutions behind uh, some very extreme claims. Uh, they claim that COVID-19 isn't a very bad disease, especially if you're healthy and under, under 60. And again, I, I note that Ole was talking about health goals being subordinated to economic goals. And I think the Great Barrington Declaration is a great example of that because uh, what they're focusing on is the economically active population. You really don't matter once you've, once you've become old or, or disabled or sick. They say that the evidence base for interfering with people's lives is weak and that the economy should be prioritized over further lockdown. Now, there was a rival memorandum published, I think, in The Lancet uh, and also on the web. I was involved in the second one called the John Snow Memorandum, and we argued that COVID-19 is serious and, and sometimes deadly, that all citizens count, even if they are old or, or, or sick, that the best way to serve the economy is to address public health. And I think that's probably something that most of us uh, listening today are, are aligned on, and also that we all need to make compromises for the good of society. So before I stop, um, I've developed some techniques which have helped me to cope with the abuse that I'm getting and with the very difficult struggles that 
scientists, particularly public health scientists, are facing in this highly toxic uh, current environment where, where, where science is being twisted for ideological reasons. The first technique is reflexivity. This is a picture of a place very close to my house. It's the River Thames. Uh, I sometimes go for a swim here, but I always go and spend about an hour out of doors uh, reflecting and having some headspace uh, before my very busy day. Uh, and I'm sure that reflexivity is going to be one of the things that you encourage and nurture in your students. Secondly, not so pleasantly, painful engagement, engaging with the abuse that you get for trying to, shall we say, speak truth to power. I need to read the abuse that I'm getting. I need to read those articles attacking my work. Thirdly, and again, I think this is something that your center might, might well teach the students, is epistemological labor. Sometimes that triangle sits very nicely with the red at the top, and what we need is a randomized controlled trial. Sometimes we need to push the triangle and say, wait a minute, we need to look at other kinds of evidence, much more interdisciplinary, respecting the methods of disciplines beyond our own. And fourthly, deconstruction, close reading of the text and unpacking what the fundamental uh, positions and assumptions and arguments are. And we really don't do enough of, enough of that in schools of medicine. So I hope uh, that that's one of the things that you're going to be doing uh, with your students in your new center. Deconstructing the science of masks, for example, we could ask what counts as facts here and how do those facts become legitimate? We can look at masks as PPE, personal protective equipment, to be tested like a drug in RCTs, randomized trials. But we could also bring a more political lens to bear. We could look at the uh, supply chain problems with PPE, which are linked to controversial choices with contracts and so on, hidden vested interests, the commercial determinants of health that Ole spoke about earlier on. I was asked to, to write an article for The Guardian about the Great Barrington Declaration, and I pushed back at the idea that we should be tackling them on scientific grounds. We said, I said, we know it's bad science. We know there's no evidence for this herd immunity hypothesis. I will not write uh, against that. What I want us to all talk about is who is funding this bad science? Where did they get their money from? And we wrote this article along with Martin McKee and Michelle Kelly Irvin questioning the right wing uh, libertarian think tanks that were funding that declaration. So here's some examples of uh, some of the papers that I and also people in your center have been writing uh, around the topics of epistemological labor and deconstruction. And I very much hope you're going to be doing more of that along with the other work in your new center. So thank you very much for your attention. Pick me up on Twitter if you want to uh, talk uh, uh, and ask some questions. Thank you so much, Trisha, for these uh, reflections and thoughts you share with us. We now move into a session to hear the students' voice. First, we will get some thoughts from a former student and a current student. Cyril Sepula Rehn graduated from one of our master programs this spring, and Vebjørn Andersson is a medical student. Both has been active student politicians, and Cyril is the lead for one of the work packages of the center. Please, Vebjørn and Cyril, the word is yours. Thank you, Nina, for that uh, beautiful introduction. Let's see if I can get my PowerPoint working here. Let's see. Yeah, so thank you all. Um, and thank you for inviting me to talk about some of the students' uh, perspective in why we need to implement the sustainable development goals in medical education. So why do we need uh, to implement? Well, in a sustainable future, healthcare is central to both achieve it and sustain it. And the scope of sustainability needs to be met with new ways of thinking 
and inspire the generation now to be the leaders of tomorrow, as also Ulu Petru said. Today's education lacks the necessary element of thinking ahead to see beyond the horizon. And we are teaching how to be good healthcare professionals to, uh, for today's problem, but not for the future. And actually soon we will educate the doctor who will be working into the 22nd century. And we need to think how that future would be. And that, and that kind of preparation needs to begin now and not post-mortem. Healthcare sustainability are closely interlinked. Health, health and sustainability are closely interlinked. And it's a prerequisite to achieve a just and fair future. And it helps to see the needs of the foundation of a good global health. Therefore, the way to achieve these goals lies in thinking of how health is a fundamental aspect. And these aspects are easy enough to understand, but it's difficult to achieve. And I believe that just we cannot just lean back on the thought that we have, have the knowledge. We also need the actions as well to achieve it. So uh, by implementing these uh, SDGs in medical education, we will be able to early see the broader picture from one's education. We will be able to see links between uh, different aspects in one education and be critical of how our education backs and contributes to these goals. We will be able to be enlightened in the context of the huge knowledge that we acquire in our studies, but also be able to form our own opinions based on past knowledge in light of today's challenges and be able to form and contribute to the necessary development. And by introducing it to all students, transdisciplinary action are possible. And we can make sure that all profession has the same outcome and outlook. And we can make a greater effort for the need for transdisciplinary work by understanding each other and see each other uh, education aspects. And I hope we will be able to see new connections and, uh, and perspective by working together. And actually, by starting now, new ways are even possible to help us. We can be able to better meet these challenges, to make changes early for maximize the impact, and push forward the need for new innovative solutions to tomorrow's problem. And as a student, I also have some hopes for the new center. Um, I wanted to be a hub for interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary education and understand that solutions to these huge challenges lies in between of the professions and to help create new ways of teaching by having teacher and student working together. And what I probably think is the most important is to inspire students and help them see how their profession can make, have an impact beyond the scopes of today's limitation. And when I was asked to, uh, to give a brief presentation, I actually Googled teaching SDGs and I came across a site uh, uh, launched by the UN, which is called teachsdgs.org. And there, I, and I hope that many of you listening today are engaged in teaching these goals. And by now you can take part in a huge network by going to uh, teachsdgs.org and be what they call an ambassador for teaching these SDGs and be a part of a better future. And we are used to taking care of people, but let's also start uh, been taught how to take care of the world. And now Tiren will take over and talk about how the students are key to achieving these goals. Thank you. Uh, okay, as you heard uh, the Beyonce and the other presenters, implementation of the SDGs in health education is important. But uh, for she, it's not just important that we do it, but also how we do it. Uh, and the Med uh, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Oslo is fortunate enough to have 
students with really strong sense of commitment. They are highly, it's a highly engaged student mass. Uh, and I think that the student mass and their commitment is one of the faculty's greatest resources. And because of this, and the fact that it's today's youth that will form the society of the future, she systematically involves the students throughout the work of the center. Uh, when, while I was a student, I was lucky enough to be a part of uh, the process with writing the application for a DQ grant together with uh, Kristin, Eivind and Elin Roswold. And when working on the application, I felt that uh, I was not there just so they could like check out the student involvement box. I was there because they genuinely wanted to hear the thoughts of students. And today, students are represented in uh, the board of SHE. They are contri contributing to the communication work. And uh, this uh, work package on student involvement is student-led. Uh, and uh, uh, in many other aspects, the, the students are a key actor. And another vital contribution for, uh, from the students was their participation in uh, related to the DQ's um, site visit. In that process in the, and in the application process, we gathered a group of students uh, and uh, asked them to share their ideas on how a DQ grant uh, could empower students and raise awareness of uh, the SDGs role in education. The outcome of this work was that we now offer scholarships to students during projects. And our student group had, uh, had many ideas uh, on how, uh, how we could uh, make these projects, what the um, result of them could be. And these ideas were really, really cool. So now every semester, the center will announce scholarship for projects related to healthcare and education and the SDGs. And these are open for the students at the faculty to apply for. All projects has to be uh, anchored academically, and this is to ensure that the standard of, ac uh, of academic quality uh, are met in the projects, but also to establish collaboration between the student and the teachers. In this way, she empowers students to play an active role in the development of education, as well as giving them the opportunity to explore aspects of health and the SDGs that they find interesting. So we have already awarded the first round of the scholarships. We did that this spring, and you will hear more about one of these projects after the break. So when working with Xi, it's been a bubbling student commitment. Uh, and it has been really inspiring to be a part of. And in SHE, we want to use this student momentum to spread their engagement among the employees at the faculty as well, and in a broader aspect. And we are convinced that the students are a key factor in realizing the vision of the center. And that is why SHE systematically involves students throughout all the work of the center. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, both uh, Rebjörn and uh, Tiril. So we will now continue with one of the uh, one presentation from the students. Uh, and as uh, heard, already this spring, we invited students to apply for scholarships to address challenges in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we'll now have a presentation of one of the projects and the group behind it that got funding. The project will be presented by three medical students, Amanda Hyllan Spjellnes, Stine Grude and Ida Sofia Sjeveland. I leave the word to you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Vi är er Emma, Sine, Ida och Amanda i podcasten Folkpeper. Vi har som mål att lära mer om sociala olikheter i hälsa och i denna säsongen gör vi det ved att utforska norsk somaliere under coronapandemin. I sista episoden svarar vi på dina frågor och kommentarer till tematiken, så send in meddelanden till oss på sociala medier under i säsongen. Folkpeper har fått stipend från Center för bärkraftig hälsoutbildning. That was the introduction to our podcast, Folkefeber. My name is Amanda, and with some others on this project, I will present uh, our podcast that is supported by SHE. First, I would like to uh, introduce our group. And uh, we got to know each other exclusively because of our common interest in social medicine in a reading group created by On the Crime Lee. And I would say that we're a uh, quite engaged group. Um, my name is Amanda and I'm a third year medical student and I'm also a research school student with a project about antibiotics use in Palestinian refugee camps. And I'm also active in the solidarity use in Norwegian People's Aid. And next to me is Ida, who is also a third year medical student and a research school student with a project about the biomedicalization of death. And together with Sina to the far left, Ida was uh, in Uganda and Rwanda on a social medicine course. And next to Ida is Emma, who's a last year medical student, and she has done the research school and has also been the leader of Medhum and uh, worked for the UN in Jordan. And then next to Emma is Sina, who's a third year medical student, and she's applying for the research school with a project about antibiotics use in Tanzania. And Emma couldn't be with us on this presentation, but after I have uh, talked about uh, our podcast in general, Ida will speak more about uh, sustainability, and then Sina will talk about uh, things we've learned during this project. So that was us. Now over to the project. Uh, Folk Feber is a podcast about inequity in health. Um, and this season, we investigate this topic through the example with Norwegian Somalis during the corona pandemic. And uh, our dream is to make several seasons of Folk Feber uh, with different topics that are related to inequity in health. And Folkfeber is a Norwegian expression, and it can be translated to meaning uh, a fever that can affect everyone in a society like COVID. So why this topic? When we saw this SHE announcement in May and we read the vision of SHE, we knew that we wanted to apply, but we didn't have a project yet. And at the time we were in this reading group, the four of us in Alna, uh, and we read a book about Mexican farm workers uh, in the US. And we discussed topics like racism, ethnicity, class, social inequality, inequity in health. And these topics really engaged us. And at the same time, approximately, uh, the statistics, statistics um, came on the 1st of April that showed that Norwegian Somalis was the most affected group by COVID in Norway. And then the idea came to create a podcast investigating this topic and how this happened. So we applied to SHE and we got the scholarship and then we started making episodes. So we have made eight episodes where we interview people that played a role during um, the COVID pandemic among uh, Norwegian Somalis in Norway. And uh, everyone we asked to be interviewed actually said yes. So uh, we are so happy uh, with all the interviews and we've interviewed very interesting and important people in Norway. And we've interviewed a patient, an activist, a doctor, a journalist, a district medical officer or Biders of Lege in Norwegian, and the Norwegian Institute of Public Health or Folkehelseinstitutet, a politician and a change maker. And we will also create a Q&A episode where we answer questions from the listeners. And uh, we are also working on an article for a journal or for a newspaper. So our aim for this podcast is divided into First, we want to increase knowledge in social medicine among medical students and others. And this includes showing that inequity in health also exists in a rich welfare country like Norway. 
And secondly, we want to contribute to create change makers among medical students and other health workers. And by change maker, we mean a person that dare to speak about inequality and that fight for equity in health. And I also want to take this opportunity to brag a little bit because we have released three episodes by now and we already have 822 playbacks, 206 listeners in 10 different countries. Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to say that this year's Corona crisis already clearly illustrates the necessity of a Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education. It is clear that the changes this pandemic has provoked, as well as the disease itself, strikes differently in the different socioeconomic classes. When the crisis first arrived in Norway in March, we, as future healthcare professionals, uh, professionals felt unequipped when faced with this inequity created and worsened by the pandemic, which so clearly manifested itself in health. The medical education, as it is in Norway today, focuses more on exposing the problems of social inequity than on helping us to become change makers ourselves. This left, at least the four of us, with a feeling of powerlessness and frustration. There, were, uh, there was very little empowerment. We believe that it is time for our education to enable us to reflect critically over the health systems and healthcare professionals' parts in creating both social equity and inequity, as well as give us the tools to see our own influence and ability to create a more just and sustainable healthcare system for future Norway. As healthcare professionals, we are in the unique position where we can contribute both directly on an individual level with our patients and in our local environment, but also on a higher structural scale with the trust and knowledge the role brings with it. The goal of our pro uh, podcast project is to take our education from information discovery to change making. We want to show how one can take a step further from acknowledging the problems to seeing opportunities and gates to change, both locally, nationally, and globally. With Xi's help, we wish to spread knowledge and create tools that can help both medical students and others in our way to go towards becoming change makers. In many ways, we are attempting to create a step-by-step -step guide in thinking systemically throughout the podcast episodes. We believe that we, with this, can contribute to Xi's goal that the UN Sustainability Goals become a naturality in future decision-making within health. If it is when facing pandemics like this, antibiotic resistance, or the major demographic changes we are facing in the future. Our main areas of focus to further this superior goal to make health more sustainable is to figure out one, how can one recognize problems within health caused by social inequity? How does one take a critical stand to simplify explanations from the media and the health system itself? And two, how can one analyze the social, economic, political, and health aspects with this, uh, which this inequity has risen from? Here, we want to do an analysis across the sustainability aim. And thirdly, how does one take the step further to explore effective intervention? Which parts, should take, uh, which parts should take part in such a discussion and how does one consider these interventions based on sustainability? And lastly, how can and should one analyze uh, the power relations that creates both gates and barriers for implementing change? How does one map one's own network and possible influence? By touching on the themes, system thinking, future orientation, and normative competency, this project will address many of the key competencies within UNESCO's framework for sustainable education. We want a shift in paradigm within our own education and are confident that this project will create grounds for a new and future-oriented focus on change and sustainability in the social medicine education. We are inspired by our co-students worldwide who takes a stand for a more just healthcare system, both within and outside the frames of the ongoing pandemic, and are extremely grateful for receiving the confidence to attempt at creating change at our own university as well. So I am going to speak to some of the aspects of what the podcast has revealed. We wanted to explore what fundamentally caused Norwegian Somalians to be disproportionately affected by the pandemic. The people we have spoken to have had many different roles and points of view during the pandemic and among Norwegian Somalians. There is a certain agreement on what uh, on some of the um, causes. Um, but some have also been surprising. For example, that it was Norwegian Somalians themselves, for example, Ayan Bashir, that you can see on the picture to the left here, who asked for the numbers revealing place of birth for the people infected on April 1st, numbers that have been widely debated. 
she knew it would cause discrimination. Still, she thought the numbers were important so that it could be justified putting in extraordinary measures towards the population. Communication and information have again and again been mentioned as the main causes of the spread of infection, and it is probably a part of the explanation. To simply put out information in Somalian at the website of the Norwegian Institute of Public Health and the Municipality of Oslo doesn't really work. To communicate in an efficient way, you need to know your population. Ayan Bashir is a Norwegian Somalian and a doctor and knew that other communication measures needed to be made. So she started making videos explaining the virus. To the right here is Faisa Vasame, who talked about the importance of what she called the jungle telegraph. Faisa uses the term jungle telegraph to describe the way they use big WhatsApp groups to provide in information that reached Norwegian Somalians. These two women uh, were also the initiators of the Somalian Corona telephone um, because the public Corona telephone was not staffed by people with the necessary language fluency in Somalian to answer the Norwegian Somalians' questions. Faisa describes it as her duty and a calling to do what she could for her community. The fact that this Corona telephone never received any funding despite the very important job that they did is worthy of criticism and is basis for a debate on what the public and what volunteers should be responsible for during the pandemic. The press has provided information to all Norwegians during the pandemic um, and were quick um, to describe the numbers on country of birth when they came on April 1st. Fredrik Solvang, um, whom you can see to the left here, uh, think the Norwegian Institute, Institute of Public Health did right by releasing the numbers and says that the media should always tell the truth. But what responsibility does the press have in providing context and nuanced explanations and how should they write about an already discriminated group like Norwegian Somalians? There might not be a right answer, but the debate is important. We also talked to Mayanne Bolgen, um, whom you can see to the right here, about what we know about our city, the city of Oslo, uh, and about the people who live here. To provide good measures, it has been essential to be knowledgeable about the Oslo population, but there is a lack of knowledge. We know a lot about overcrowded housing, which several times have been brought up as one of the main reasons for the high numbers of people infected among Norwegian Somalians. Knowledge about minorities and their use of healthcare services is lacking. And as an example, um, yeah, and some of the assumptions that have been made have not been correct according to the research that have been done. An example on that is that most people have assumed and written about um, that Norwegian Somalians have uh, more chronic diseases than the general public. Um, but the research provided by the Norwegian Public Health Institute actually says the opposite. Um, Norwegian Somalians have fewer chronic diseases than the general public in Norway. Uh, Ibrahim is a Norwegian Somalian who became infected with Corona. You can see him to the left here. Uh, and he describes in the first episode that it boils down to structural causes that were present long before March 12. He describes that, the, that, the experience, that he experiences racism in his everyday life and that it sometimes feels like he's digging into a brick wall with a spoon trying to stand up against it. Ibrahim works as a taxi driver, but is actually an architect. That illustrates one of the most fundamental causes we've been able to explore in this podcast, socioeconomics. Camilla Stoltenberg um, and the Norwegian Institute of Public Health launched a report in July um, that among other themes highlighted how socioeconomics have played a role during the pandemic. We can talk a lot about the big and small causes that contributed to the spread of infection in the beginning of the pandemic, but we are pretty sure socioeconomics is in the very core. We talked to Embla Matisen, the leader of Changemaker about that, because we don't just want to talk about the causes of this issue, we want to inspire to change. Whether or not the podcast has done that, we have yet to conclude, but it has already sparked interesting conversations and discussions, and we hope it will continue to do so. A sustainable healthcare service must be equipped to take care of the needs of the entire Norwegian populations in the future. Uh, and we hope that our podcast will contribute to that. Thank you to Xi and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much uh, for this. It's very inspiring to have students with this kind of approach. Really looking forward to it. And I think you will also be 
be pioneers and, and uh, change makers towards uh, recruiting more students into this. We will now get a few comments from one of the uh, mentors in this, Anne Kaim Lee, already mentioned, among the staff at the medical faculty. Anne is one of the driving forces for development of our educational programs, and in particular to align the curriculum better to the societal need. Please, Anna. Thank you. Oh, I'm so proud of these students. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. And I uh, encourage you all to listen to that podcast because the episodes that are out now is just mind blowing. Uh, so it's incredible interviewing, it's well thought through. And it's also, in addition, they've also made this fantastic broadcast. So they've managed to actually made, make it being listened to, which I also think we should credit in this perspective. So I think, I mean, we in the medical faculty, we are surrounded by bright students, but we do not take enough um, uh, advantage of them. And there's a lot of talent uh, being spilled because we do not actually equip them with the right tools to make these kind of things that these, uh, that uh, Amanda, Sina, uh, and Ida, uh, um, and Emma have, have done here. So uh, I think, I mean, there's, so I'm really grateful for this center, not only for giving the students the possibilities to produce podcasts, but also to, to uh, giving us as teachers the uh, more power behind our wishes uh, to uh, create an education more in line with the new sustainable, uh, the, more in line with the current or the demands of the current world and there's a lot of us who wants that but it's really difficult to make that happen and um uh, i just want to uh i just want to show you a slide uh so sorry about that why do i get trina why do i get uh, okay there it is so now you see a wrong. So because my my um, my argument is that that is I mean changing curriculum in medical school is moving a mountain. Uh, it that that might you I might be taken to mean that it's impossible I don't mean that but it's really really difficult and I think that she has to know uh, she has to know that in order to be able to create change in in the curriculum and medical schools because it's it's really and I, I think you know that but uh, but it's it's really hard because and the reason why I'm saying this is that I have gotten some requests from students who have produced things uh, for she and ask, been asked whether I could introduce that in my teaching uh, or in our curriculum. And it's that's I mean, for for this group of four, that's easy because it's the, it fits perfectly well into what we are some of the many of the things we are teaching and actually or I'm teaching and actually more than I thought. So, for instance, this thing of advocacy. Uh, and uh, and the aspect, the importance of including the groups that you are engaging with, both in population population samples and individually. I mean, it, it speaks to our teaching and user involvement as well. So it's really for for me, this is very easy to use. But I think that in order to have the students produce things that can be used in teaching. The, it has to speak, uh, it has to be much more or closely developed together with teachers. Uh, and, uh, and, and I just uh, want to uh, say a few words about the mountain that is that we have to change. Because there's, there's these hundreds of learning outcomes. There's disciplines fighting for time on the curriculum. They're fighting among them, but there's also professors within each discipline fighting for time. And they have been, I mean, conflicts have resolved and things are going as, as usual, but it's so difficult to change precisely because of all this uh, uh, processes going on and there's uh, no central core or at least there is a central coordination but there's very little I say no it's it's very cent little central coordination so it takes a lot to move this mountain 
So I think that uh, it's important, and in light of these podcasts and the students' initiatives, that it's important to combine both bottom-up and top-down alternatives. And that we should go from listening to students to empower them to help us change the curriculum. I think that students here are crucial because they are the ones who sit there listening to everything that we deliver. And it's, I mean, in, unless we're going to spend six years sitting down on every lecture, we have to use them and to involve them. Um, so what can we do? I mean, I think we should actually, uh, or one, these are only some suggestions. I sh one possibility is actually to pay to sit down and take notes, arrange focus groups and collaborate with teachers along the way. But, and that is important, that has to be, I mean, the, the results of such settings should be used as the foundation for top-down initiatives, because without these top-down initiatives, nothing would change. Also, I mean, I'm really into the sustainability agenda, but even for me, as an universitysleder in my topic, which is about everything about, you know, society and medicine, it's really difficult because I have to make all my, the compromises with my teachers. So it's, it's, you also need top-down initiatives. But congratulations with the opening of this really important center. I look so much forward to collaborating with you and I'm so grateful that you have taken the work to uh, ask or to, to get, uh, get this funding and for in, involving the students and to the four students. I mean, you're amazing, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anna, and uh, for this. And we will now make another illustration uh, about the ideas and the foundations for the center. So we'll move to the topic of overuse of treatment. And Knut Lundin is one of many of the staff who's interested in this topic. And he has also made it, this an educational issue and asks how we can approach this by educational means. Please, Knut. And so let me start by thanking uh, uh, everybody and con congratulations to this uh, center, which is so important. Uh, a huge achievement for our faculty and the University of Oslo. And also thank you, Eivind, for some very interesting discussions with you and Christian Hagen about uh, this topic with which I'm very much the, uh, involved in fact for many years. My name is Knut Lundin. I'm uh, uh, at the Institute of Clinical Medicine, head of the clinical education. Uh, I'm an internist, a gastroenterologist, and, and in my, my clinical service and, uh, and my research, I'm working extremely uh, focused and uh, oriented uh, towards the really small details in medicine, but uh, this is completely different and uh, much more important. So the topic I was given was dilemmas related to overuse of treatment and uh, uh, provide some ideas how can we target this by educational means. And then Nina, I'm sorry, I don't have the solutions yet, but I'm uh, confident that we will uh, develop uh, our medical education further. I also could not resist uh, to show a picture of this uh, person on the right here. Uh, as a, an illustration of something which is a, a major problem in, in Western uh, medicine. Uh, this is Professor, President uh, Donald Trump uh, in his uh, uh, emergency room, uh, and he received during a rather trivial and uh, not severe uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, a cocktail of drugs which are uh, otherwise um, only used in severely ill uh, uh, patients, dexamethasone, remdesivir, and the Regeneron, co Regeneron uh, cocktail of uh, antibodies. And this illustrates to a certain extent what is, uh, has been the focus of a lot of work in, in clinical medicine the last years, uh, which is summarized uh, like Doing more does not mean doing better. And also the slogan, less is uh, more. So what is this, the, this all about? And I think it fits very well with the, with the goal of, of Xi. First, uh, this graph um, from the Kaiser Foundation, uh, the numbers go up to January 2012 we can see a dramatic increase in uh, uh, total health expenditure 
of course, the the graphs. I mean, this is nearly ten years ago, and uh, and uh, I can assure you that this has exploded even more. Uh, so the total amount of money used on health expenditure per capita in many many countries are just uh, exploding uh, all the time. This is not sustainable. And what is also not sustainable is the cost of unnecessary services delivered in healthcare. So you can see uh, from this, uh, uh, well, is it a cookie slide, uh, cost in billion US uh, uh, data, a lot of resources uh, being uh, invested in uh, unnecessary services, uh, inefficiently delivered to services, administrative cost and excessive pricing. And of course, we can argue, uh, is this less in this country? Well, probably not. This is a, a com out of proportion overuse and misuse of non-diagnostic testing. So some of the current paradigm, uh, uh, often many doctors, many students, many people in the general community think that if some medical care is good, then more care should be better. And that newer technology is always better than older methods. Also a, a misunderstanding that getting a medical test can't hurt we should look into this. Uh, that's what uh, Donald Trump often says. Uh, uh, prevention is about getting the right test at the right time, another misunderstanding. And I'm not gonna go into details about cancer screenings and cardiac screenings because that is a really uh, difficult uh, uh, topic. Uh, but uh, many people have argued that uh, uh, do these screening programs do any good or uh, maybe uh, they don't do any uh, good. So what to do instead? Prevention uh, by lifestyle choices and public health measures. Uh, medical care needs to be the right test or treatment for the right patient at the right time. Almost all care has uh, benefits uh, and risks. Uh, we often as doctor only think of the benefits and we neglect uh, the risks. Uh, so in a way we think that, well, it can happen, but uh, uh, it will not happen with my, my patients. And in general terms, if a test or treatment has no known benefit, no risk is acceptable. So this has been, been, been the focus of a, a work which has been spread all over uh, clinical medicine. Um, the initiative came from uh, uh, the US uh, who really saw this as a major problem. Uh, they initiated the Choosing Wisely campaign, uh, which has been run in the US for uh, several years. We have a, a, a European uh, counterpart of that uh, as part of the European Federation for Internal Medicine, where I've been active for uh, a couple of decades or so. Um, and then we have also introduced this to Norwegian uh, Internal Medicine. This is uh, Professor Antonio Vascarneiro. Uh, head of the uh, uh, Cochrane Foundation in Portugal. In Portugal, they have produced a lot of papers uh, on the Choosing Wisely initiative and what to do, what not to do, what to avoid. And we do work with this as well within in Norwegian internal medicine, as many other uh, Norwegian um, specialties uh, uh, are working with, geriatrics, uh, medicine, immunology, radiology, gynecology, etc. And this is the web page. This uh, will be have to be combined into our curriculum. And I just want to point to, uh, uh, for me, a uh, tremendous inspiration in thinking about uh, uh, science. And that was the conference in 2019. Uh, uh, a lot of people attended at the Georg Sveidrufsius. Uh, fortunately, it was before the COVID-19, so we could meet in the same room and experience and talk and discuss. And one of the, the main the keynote speaker there was Anthony Smith, so from University College of London. And I just want you to take a look at the lower two slides here, which are full of details. Students-wise, 
we really care about our students. We love our students. Uh, sometimes we do not always agree with our students, but uh, it is exactly the same topics and the same questions that our students raise to us that uh, uh, Anton is uh, referred to from the University College of London. Do they feel they have a voice? Do they feel they listened to? Is their feedback acted uh, upon? And why do we need that? Well, there are diverse student needs. Uh, also, it's uh, staff uh, face workload issues is a problem, of course, at the medical uh, clinical medicine uh, uh, part of our study. We have something like 350 teachers, uh, a lot of opinions. Uh, we want to encourage, they want to, we want to encourage partnership rather than consumerism in higher education. So uh, a student should never be looked upon uh, like, on, uh, like a student. And we need to empower students and gain more skills. What does this, uh, uh, how can this be met in our curriculum? Well, first bullet point, uh, realistic goal. Um, if the clinicians do not cope with the less is more initiative, the choosing wisely initiative, how can we expect uh, this uh, from the students? I think that doing the right, uh, uh, picking the right choices or, or doing the right decisions is a really on top of our cognitive uh, learning. We need to focus a long-term uh, goal to heighten the students and the clinicians' awareness on source validity. And that is the focus of all teaching these days from our Barnes uh, School, Grundschule, et cetera. And we need to really take that into account also in, in our medical curriculum. We need to increase the curiosity. <clears throat> we need to uh, uh, raise the awareness on, on training and thinking evidence-based medicine, and uh, we already have that. Uh, uh, to some extent, we need to broaden it, and we are involved with a, uh, an initiative in uh, women's health uh, addressing exactly evidence-based medicine. And my last point is that uh, we have to accept uh, less details in our learning uh, objectives. The students are not consumers, uh, they are students. And we shall, as Anthony Smith said, we shall educate them in uh, how to think, not to, what to, to think. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. To me, this seminar has shown that we have an enormous resource uh, at the faculty, at the university and around us. And uh, although we might need to move a mountain, at least to me, it seems that this center may at least contribute to make it happen. We have invited our key speakers Tisha Greenau and Ole Petter Ottersen to comment on what you have heard and to give some comments. And I will first ask Trish to present some comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nina. Well, first of all, congratulations to Amanda, Sine, Edith, Sophie and Emma. That was just a fantastic presentation. It's made me so happy to know that there are students who who feel so passionately and who've done so well to integrate so many different perspectives on a really important uh, challenge. While I was listening to your presentation, I decided I was gonna write down all the different disciplines that you mentioned, which are relevant to your project. So here's the things I wrote down. Anthropology, sociology, psychology, epidemiology, health policy, pharmacology, health systems analysis, political science, critical public health, economics, but also philosophy, music, art, video making. Let's not forget that the arts and humanities are as important as the sciences in this huge task of getting people to care about uh, the SDGs and about social justice in healthcare more generally. Um, so now let me just speak briefly to Ivan, Kristen, and the rest of you at the University of Oslo. You have set up a new center. And I am reminded of uh, a, a gentleman called Wilhelm von, von Humboldt, who 
set up a university in Berlin in 1809. It was then called the University of Berlin. And when he was trying to find funding for his university, people asked him, why do you need to set this thing up? It's called a university. What are you going to teach? Why do, you, why do we need it? Uh, and he said, I'm going to teach four things. By the time my students have uh, done their course in the university, they will be able to think constructively, argue coherently, judge dispassionately, and solve problems creatively. And those, I think, are the traditional academic skills, which are very, very evident and visible in your students. But also, um, I set up a course 20 years ago, and I thought those are not enough anymore. We also need some contemporary academic skills. Uh, and I've written about these. And the four new academic skills that we must add to Humboldt's traditional skills are these. Firstly, knowledge management, the ability to find the knowledge that you need in this ocean of vast uh, information uh, and, and evidence uh, in the 21st century. Secondly, the ability to work in groups, that the lone academic is history. We have to work together. And I think your students demonstrated so well uh, that they can do this and, and they enjoy doing this and, and they get more out of the group work than just an individual project. Thirdly, and again, your students demonstrated this really well, is the ability to communicate and knowing that they must communicate to people beyond their own uh, disciplinary basis. Uh, and finally, lifelong learning. We are all students for the rest of our professional lives. Uh, so we need to develop in our students the ability to identify their ongoing learning needs in a changing world. So I hope that commentary was helpful to you. I'm even more excited than I was previously uh, that I'm going to be working with you all at this centre. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've had a really good time watching. Uh, so now I can sit back and watch the other commentators. Thank you so much, Trish. Ole Petter, from what you have heard, what do you think? Are we on the right track? You are certainly on the right track, and I think I made that very clear in my <clears throat> in my introduction that you are certainly on, on the right track. You are doing what all universities should do, and that is to focus not only on the present day situation, but on the future, how the healthcare system will develop, on how, on how health will develop in the years to come. So um, this is a fantastic initiative. Uh, I must say that uh, with due respect to um, those of you who have initiated this project as leaders today, I think we should really emphasize how important it is to listen to the leaders of tomorrow. The students have a very, very important role to play in this. And uh, I must say that uh, the presentations from the students, they really made my day, as it were. What we experienced last year at KI, I told you about the conference that we had with more than 500 students from all, from many different universities, also from uh, universities beyond Sweden and, and the Nordic countries, is that uh, the students are very much focused on the future. They really, in many ways, um, assimilate the dimension that is missing very often uh, in the universities, and that is the time dimension of the future. Uh, we have to take care as leaders in the university. We have to take care because all of a sudden the students are ahead of us when it comes to pondering the future and how to deal with the uh, global challenges. And I think we saw today that uh, this is an imminent danger, if you understand. It's not a danger, but it could be a, a situation uh, in the very near future that the students are ahead of us as university leaders when it comes to grasping and understanding the challenges of the future. We must not let this happen. It's our responsibility as university leaders to really capture the energy, the visions of the students so that we can develop 
as universities in the right direction. Willem von Humboldt that Fischer mentions, I mentioned is, is of course a founding father of the modern university. In fact, uh, Karolinska Institute was uh, established almost at the same time as uh, Humboldt University in Berlin. But there is another founding father of the university that we should pay attention to, and that is John Henry Newman, the idea of a university. He spent most of his life in the uh, 19th century to ponder what is a university all about. And in fact, we have forgotten very much of what he uh, came up with as ideas of a university. What he said that one of the most important parts, roles of a university is that minds should collide with minds. That's a quote from his major book on this issue. And uh, minds collide with minds that uh, can be interpreted in different ways. But what he really meant, if I understand him correctly, is that one should see to it that the university is a place <clears throat> where we have a sort of symmetrical exchange of ideas between generations, between students and teachers. And if there is anything I think we should carry with us from John Henry Newman, that is that in centers like this, as in education in general, we should respect and encourage the voices of the students because that is really what drives us to a better understanding of the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, I wonder if we could actually uh, invite, it's very unprepared, but I wonder, Ivan, would you like to add a comment or two here? Is Ivan with us? Yes, yes we, are here. we are here. And we have been listening to all the presentations and I think also the presentations for the students sort of made my day. I will specifically highlight them. And of course, I agree with uh, Ole Petter, uh, with Trista. That has been our experience when we have developed this center that we have to rely and close collaboration with the students. They have a fantastic energy and they are forward looking and so on. So yeah, music in my ears. Yeah, following up on that, I think that what I really hear today is that, I mean, what is that we don't, future health professionals do not only need knowledge, they also need this this engagement, this involvement that this, I mean, the group of students and their, and their talk also illustrates. And I mean, that is also essential to all the presentations that we have heard today. I mean, uh, Trish talked about critical thinking, the importance of deconstruction and critical thinking. We have heard about the importance of multidisciplinary approaches or multi-sectoral approaches. And I think these three words actually, engagement, multidisciplinarity, and, uh, and, uh, and critical thinking, that is the essence of what at least I want to obtain with, uh, with this center. So thank you so much for, for, uh, for the presentations and the, and the comments. It's been fantastic listening to you. Thank you. Um, I think we're now in uh, time for starting our uh, closing uh, remarks. Uh, we have again a representative from the students, uh, who is Ulina Maria Sete. Uh, she's chair of the Medicine Students Committee, and she's also one of the two students in the SHE board and a soon to be fourth year medical student. She has also done some work on more uh, uh, making videos and interviews, etc. this summer. So she's be, really been into it and knows a lot about it. So please, Olina. Thank you, Nina. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all of those who have shared wise thoughts and perspectives here today. What has been said here today is only the beginning of SHE. Today, we saw its first contours. What we heard here today strengthens my belief in that she may be the opportunity we have all been waiting for. 
an opportunity to put sustainability in health as well as in education on the agenda. Those two are interlinked. Striving to reach one does not work without also trying to reach the other. Mahatma Gandhi once said, if we are to teach real peace in the world, we shall have to begin with the children. For today's occasion, I would like to take the liberty to rephrase the quote a little and say, if we are to achieve a sustainable world, we, have, we shall have to begin with the students. Because what really makes me believe in the vision of Xi and how Xi, with his ambitious plans, encourages students to claim the driver's seat and thereby, thereby transcending the generational boundaries. Some may think, is that really wise? Students are known to be bold, impatient, and visionary. Or should we rather say, instead of visionary, a little bit unrealistic? I believe that what she has set out to do, let students claim the driver's seat to make a more sustainable healthcare and eventually a more sustainable world, is both wise and right. To solve such a complex challenge as it is to make a sustainable world, we have to be bold. We have to do things that has never been done before. Maybe fail a couple of times, but always get back on the horse and impatiently, impatiently give it another try. The challenge of making a sustainable world doesn't solve itself. There are enough powers in the world that will always say, wait, is that wise? Is that right? Shouldn't we rather wait? Impatience is therefore a must to outweigh those who would rather sit still than act. We have to give it a try again and again, and we have to start now. It might sound like I'm encouraging us to reach for the stars. Maybe it all sounds a bit unrealistic. I'm sure many said the same things about Martin Luther King's ideas or Ruth Bader Ginsburg. People say today about Greta Thunberg. Visionary people and visionary ideas have often been deemed unrealistic through history. But to achieve real change, we have to reach far ahead, further than what may be realistic in the moment. But there are always those who try to step on the brakes, those who say wait, and those who slow the change process down. But I, will, I believe she will overcome those powers because she has teamed up with the students. By doing so, we have made sure there's always someone willing to step on the gas pedal and speed a little ahead. Can the students do it all by themselves? No, definitely not. Like Annick Fang Lee said, we need to combine, combine bottom-up and top-down initiatives. We have to co-pilot, but together with a strong leadership and bottom-up initiatives, the possibilities are endless. And as a student, I'm eager to see what we, the students, the staff, she and the surrounding world will achieve together. Today certainly strengthens my hopes that it will be something great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olina. Uh, we now have, will have a word from Jens Petterberg, who is a pro dean at the medical faculty. Please, Jens Petter. Uh, so, uh, I've been invited to give some of the closing remarks from the Faculty of Medicine. And it's a great pleasure for me to uh, uh, express congratulations and best wishes to the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Education from the faculty. We are very impressed by the efforts that all partners have contributed with to make this center come true, both in the planning, in the writing, in the rethinking, maybe also some arguing, revising, submitting, presenting, and finally convincing the evaluators that we need a center for sustainable healthcare education, and we need it now. It's been really exciting to follow you and the evolution of the application process on the sideline, cheering and applauding, and now finally congratulating you. And actually in this very moment, proudly exclaim that the faculty for the first time ever has a center for excellence in education. And I also want to thank uh, DQ for the financial support of the center. Now why this project and why you and why now? Now, these three whys are frequently asked when challenging new projects and ideas. And the three whys can also be posed to the idea of a center for sustainable healthcare education. Uh, during this webinar, we have had excellent presentations which have answered the why this, why you, and why now. 
Ivan Engelbretsen and Kristin Hagen, I'm sure you uh, the bold ideas. They have an ambition to educate change agents in healthcare using UN Sustainable Development Goals as a guidance. What could be a more appropriate answer to why this in the midst of a pandemic as described by Trisha Grinnell? At the same time, you must not weaken our attention to the other serious health challenges. The last special issue on the global burden of disease earlier this month optimistically announced that the fall rates of age standardized disability adjusted life years of DALI since 1990 have been the largest for communicable maternal, neonatal, and nutritional diseases. And progress has even been fastest in the past decade. However, uh, once again, data shows that uh, health depends on more than just health systems. The Lancet points to a strong correlation between health and the social demographic index and suggests that the health sector should consider redefining its scope of concern, which fits with the vision of she. So why you then, the young generation, the students, you have really committed yourselves and actively taken part in shaping the center. We have listened with great interest to Vivian Andersson and Tiril Separared explaining the need for SDG implementation in education. And we have heard Amanda Hyllands Bjellnes, Sine Grude and Ida Sibir Sjerland present a student-led project about Norwegian Somalis in the corona pandemics and also as commented by Anne Kvang Lee. And finally, Willina Setter commented on student involvement in the center from a medicine students uh, committee and she board perspective. The participation of students is of vital importance when you have to set out to educate change agents and perhaps redefine the scope of concern in healthcare as suggested by the Lancet. Such an endeavor starts and ends uh, with education and re-education in a continuum. You need a foundation of change-friendly and change-willing minds with an experience and knowledge as is exemplified by the lecturers this afternoon. I would say, she, you have a brilliant team, which clearly answers the why you question. Uh, Ole Petter Ottersen reflected on the university's responsibility to rethink higher education in light of the SDGs. The EU policy report entitled Towards the 2030 Vision of the Future of Universities in Europe proposes that European universities has to transform to effective generators and transmitters of trusted knowledge, of innovation and developers of talent in order to address key societal challenges. Every one of you and the center with its human and other resources will be an important tool to transform the University of Oslo in accordance with such a vision. And finally, why now? Although the global burden of disease has diminished during the last decades, the healthcare costs have outpaced global economic growth the last 20 years. Newt Lundin exemplified in his lecture the dilemma related to treatment options and expenditures and possible solutions through education. An OECD report predicts that the growth in healthcare expenses will continue to exceed economic growth also during the next decade. This can, of course, not go on forever. The English broadcaster and natural historian David Attenborough calmly explains this to us in the documentary A Life on Our Planet. Anything that we can't do forever is, by definition, not sustainable. So we need sustainable healthcare now. The Faculty of Medicine and University of Oslo possesses a multitude of resources. Please engage us and use the faculty in your research for solutions. Invite yourselves to the institutes, to the departments, to the research groups, to the professors, even those uh, hanging in a horn on the wall as in the fairy tale. Inspire us with your ideas and let us take part in your mission to change healthcare education for sustainability and redefining our scope of concern. So there is no time to lose. I will therefore end now by this appeal and wish you all the best and success for the Center for Sustainable Health Education. I will thank the speakers for stimulating presentations.
and thanks to you all for attending the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jens Petter. Um, and for me, I would also like to thank you all uh, for the presentations and also from uh, uh, to the uh, attendees for your interest and participation, which is really inspiring to us. Uh, and a special thank, of course, to Christine and Ivan and uh, for initiating this uh, at all. So, Trina and Sindra for preparation and support during the seminar. Thank you for that. And for all of you, you will get more information early next week about where to find the recorded version of this seminar. And then uh, it's only left for me to say thank you again and have a nice and safe weekend. Bye-bye.